everyone, and welcome to Things We Said Today. This is a bi-weekly Beatles podcast where we discuss anything and everything to do with the Beatles together in solo and all things Beatles related as well. My name is Darren DeVivo. I'm from WFUV Radio in New York City at 90.7 FM in New York City. We are a non-commercial public radio station. You can also listen to us anywhere uh, on our website. We stream at WFUV.org. You can listen on our app. And I've been on the air at WFUV now for a very long time. I kind of forgot how to count. Uh, but uh, last time I checked, it's uh, close to 40 years. And speaking of 40 years, almost, uh, my co-host, uh, we have Alan, we have Ken, and Ken Michaels uh, has been doing radio for almost that same amount of time. Longtime radio personality, and most of the time that he's been broadcasting, Ken Michaels has been doing Beatles-oriented programs. Um, he spent a little time at XM Satellite Radio, currently hosts syndicated Beatles radio show Every Little Thing, as well as uh, one of the hosts of the video cast, Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast. He's to my left over here. I don't know about for you, but there's Ken Michaels. Hello, Ken. Hi, Darren. From where I'm sitting, I'm on I'm on your right. OK, uh, that sounds knows? good. So that if I turned around anyway. And it's Alan, so nice oh. to be with you. I just wanted to say. Oh, thank you. Uh, Alan Cozen's down down here, at least on my screen. Alan's the acclaimed writer, journalist and music critic who spent a uh, look at that nearly 40 years at the New York Times, writing about classical music and the Beatles. And over the years, he's contributed to countless publications, uh, the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, Popular Mechanics, and many more. Now, Alan's also written uh, numerous books. Uh, they include The Beatles, From the Cavern to the Rooftop, and Got That Something, How the Beatles, I Want to Hold Your Hand, Changed Everything. And uh, Alan Cozen has changed everything for us here. At things we said today, Alan, how are you? I'm um, fine, Darren. How about you? All right. Now, did Good. you know you contributed to Popular Mechanics? I didn't. No. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to be kind of like you know cool and natural about it, and like look at the camera, which is right here, <laughs> while I'm obviously reading. But um, anyway, welcome aboard, folks, to another edition of Things We Said Today. So uh, if you know the show, you know that once uh, we're done introducing ourselves, we hand it over to Ken, who is uh, always up on the latest Beatle news and Beatle related news. So yours, Ken. Thank you, Darren. I think we should add more credits to ourselves. Just make them up <laughs> in each show and just see if was, anybody picks up on it. <laughs> I was, I was going to start it, but I thought I was going to. My co-host, Ken, he has a beard. And Alan, he does <laughs> and leave it at that, you know, something like that. But maybe next I was, was going to say with the 40 years for all of us I, uh, that uh, we're all going to look like old Fred from <laughs> Yellow Submarine pretty soon. I kind of already do, but that's <laughs> I walk like old Fred. That's for for certain. All right. So let's get to the latest news uh, with the brand new box set for Let It Be coming out October 15th. Universal has made available an unboxing of uh, the box set. It's a brief kind of commercial for the set, plus four songs that you can now stream. Get Back, take eight. One After 909, take three. I Me Mine, the 1970 Glenn Johns mix, and the new mix for Across the Universe. So something to whet your appetite a month before it all comes out. The brand new November issue of Mojo magazine features the Beatles on the front cover and celebrates the new Beatles Get Back film and Let It Be album. It includes information on the new film, the new box set and the new book with contributions from Paul McCartney, Peter Jackson, uh, Glenn Johns, Giles Martin and Michael Lindsay Hogg. It also has a 15 song CD of Beatle covers plus a Beatles art print. I love when those magazines give you a CD of covers. Mm -hmm. I love exploring that because so many times you'll get these artists who are new for today and they end up being bigger artists a few years down the road, but you hear right. them early on mm -hmm. when they're doing something like this. 
covering Beatle music. Two weeks ago, there were free screenings at venues and online of John and Yoko's film Imagine, along with a listening party from Twitter. If you go to YouTube, you will find the radio special over an hour long of an after party special with interviews from Sean Lennon, Klaus Vorman, Alan White, Elliot Mintz, and others. You will find it other John and Yoko's Imagine Film Listening Party After Show. I've been meaning to get to this. I definitely will. The window was right up there on the computer. Anytime I can just play it. But um, I've heard from a lot of people. It's, it's a great special. It was a night on the town last Friday night in London when Paul McCartney and wife Nancy, Ringo Starr and Barbara Bach, and Olivia Harrison were pictured in Chelsea outside the Italian restaurant Scalini with uh, Paul wearing a black ensemble with a paisley print mask and Ringo opting for a plain black face covering. Nice to see them all getting together. Paul McCartney will be interviewed in a world exclusive event at South Bank Central's Royal Festival Hall on November the 5th to discuss his career spanning book, The Lyrics 1956 to the Present. He'll be joined by Paul Muldoon Pulitzer Prize winning author, poet, and editor of the lyrics. The moderator for the evening will be journalist, broadcaster, and writer Samira Ahmed. In addition to the physical event, this will also be live streamed around the world. South Bank Central's members already got the first chance to book this on September 16th, and general booking and tickets for the live stream went on sale the following day. To find out more, visit uh, this website, you can go to, well, mpl.pm slash lyrics events. There'll be a live stream available from November 6th through the 12th. The price for this is £10 for the UK, $14 in the US. So if you pay for this, you'll also be able to watch for the next uh, week or so that live stream uh, on demand. Last week, Paul McCartney was at an exhibition in London that was quietly dedicated to Linda McCartney by artist Brian Clark, uh, who was Paul's collaborator on his stage sets during his 1989 and 1993 world tours, and also did the album covers for Tug of War and Flowers in the Dirt. In the 90s, Clark collaborated with Linda for a series of stained glass artwork. Also, there's a brand new limited edition issue that has just come out for Super Deluxe Edition magazine on Paul McCartney's album, Press to Play. And I got it right here. Just got it in the mail yesterday. I got mine today. Okay. Very nice. Um, only a thousand copies were made, all of which were signed by editor Paul Sinclair. And the first 500, they say, are signed by Hugh Padgham, who co-produced the album with Paul. It includes an interview with Padgham, stories behind all the songs, plus others recorded during the sessions that weren't included on the album, like Spies Like Us and Hang Glide. Just started to read the interview. Looks really good, the one with, uh, with Padgham. From the always excellent Facebook page, The Beatles in Print, Together and Solo, we learn of a new book coming out next year in October called With a Love Like That by Michael Feeney. Uh, Callan, C-A-L-L-A-N. This is Amazon's description. Here for the first time is an intimate look inside the Beatles and their relationships with their muses, the women who shared the Beatles' lives from their teens through Beatlemania to the breakup. In evaluating the lives of these storied women, the book charts unrecorded collaborations and the startlingly revelatory autobiographical nature of the band's most famous songs. It also unfolds as an eye-opening alternative history of the forces that brought the Beatles together and ultimately tore them apart. Again, that's coming out next year in October with a love like that. A reminder, this Friday is the big day. Ringo's new EP called Change the World is released. His new EP, Change the World, is coming out. It's four new recordings from Ringo. Uh, it's going to be available on CD, cassette, download, and streaming. There'll also be a 10-inch vinyl coming out on November the 19th. In addition to Ringo's EP coming out this Friday, don't forget October 12th is the release date for the Get Back book, 
October 15th, the box set for Let It Be. And November 2nd is the date for Paul McCartney, the lyrics book. That's all the news I have this time. Okay. Magnificent. And I do apologize for the uh, music. Uh, there is that you? News. That was me. I don't know if you, that came through. But, yes, uh, it did. I heard it. I think it did. And I apologize. But I just figured we needed to liven things up with a little music. So I thought I'd just throw that in there for you. Okay. All right. Uh, uh, anyway, thank you, Ken. Um, I, you know, it's funny with all the things going with Get Back and, and coming off of All Things Must Pass. I honestly kind of forgot that Ringo's EP is just days away now. Right. So it's always like exciting that. for me. Any new music yeah. from, from Paul or Ringo, anything br brand new, it's something we shouldn't take for granted. Oh, you're you totally know? right. It's well, today's uh, theme uh, is um, not, it's different from our last theme, but last week we talked about uh, songs. These were songs that, um, you know, album finales that made an impact for us. And we're going to stay on the topic of songs and today talk about um, songs that we appreciate more now than when we first heard them or when they were first released, whatever the case might be. And, um, and we decided what we would do is just any, any mix, could be all five Beatles songs, could be all five solo songs or a mix of, uh, of the two of them, which made it a little easier for me. Uh, and I didn't realize how hard this would be once I tried to get down to uh, picking my songs. It was easier when it came to albums. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. what albums that when I first heard the album, it was like, all right, that doesn't click. And then at some point, for some reason, it did it click. But we're going to go with songs today. The songs, five of them that we appreciate more today than we did when we were first uh, exposed to them. And I guess we'll. Start with Alan. Uh, go with Alan first. You're up. Okay. Um, so, you know, I mean, it, it was sort of an interesting topic because when it comes to Beatles stuff, um, I had thought, okay, I, I pretty much feel the same way about the Beatles stuff now as when I first heard it. Um, and nothing's changed there. But as I thought about it, I thought, you know, I actually, if, if I'm being honest, that's not entirely true. Um, I didn't really care much for Within You Without You when Pepper came out. Um, none of my friends did either. You know, um, we tended to skip that one sometimes. I mean, listen to it sometimes too, but because, um, you know, the experience of the whole album and all of that stuff. Um, but I just didn't uh, get it. And it was also, you know, quite long by Beatles standards of the time. Um, and all those odd instruments and, you know, orchestra and uh, sort of philosophy and all that stuff. Um, I think really what, what it was, was the, you know, that album came out, I was like, uh, you know, 12. And I probably just didn't have the maturity to deal with something like Within You Without You, which is actually a brilliant song, you know? Mm -hmm. um, the only solace I can take is that George Martin in his interviews said that he went through pretty much the same process, that he didn't like it when it was new. He, he thought it was kind of a, a waste, not a waste of time. I mean, he did an incredible score for it, um, mm -hmm. but that over the years he came to appreciate it more. And, uh, you know, I think in, in general, um, that's the case with a lot of Georgia's stuff, um, certainly from the Beatles era. Um, you know, we, we sort of were so caught up in the Lennon McCartney, you know, kind of thing, which was, you know, they were different kinds of songwriters than George was. And I think it took, I think it took people a long time to really appreciate that in all of its fullness um, and, and to come to terms with something like Within You Without You in the context of what was still sort of a pop group. They were, they were getting a little more experimental, but um, that was really quite experimental. Mm -hmm. um, so um, the second one, um, only because I actually don't remember what my original impression of Revolution 9 was. Um, I, I suspect it, it was puzzlement. Um, now I think it's a masterpiece. 
Um, but so skipping that, because I, I, I really don't remember not liking it particularly, it, it, it just, you know, uh, I'm going to skip to I Want You, She's So Heavy. Mm, um, good pick. I Want You, She's So Heavy, you know, struck me at the time as just, you know, okay, there's like really just two lines in it and uh, it just keeps repeating. And then there's the white noise and why are we getting all this white noise? And, you know, that isn't really the proper way of approaching that song. Um, I look at it differently now because, um, you know, here it is sort of a, a piece of, of, rock and roll proto minimalism you know i mean minimalism was starting around the time i mean some some of the minimalist composers like terry riley go back to 1964 uh with in c which is a you know now a, a minimalist standard you you hear it in concert more frequently than you hear the beethoven fifth symphony you know um uh, and there are others that go back earlier than Terry Riley, but, you know, minimalism was basically, um, it, it was a lot of different things for different composers, but one main aspect of it was repeating short, sometimes not so short phrases over and over and, and getting a cumulative effect in some process usually takes place during that repetition. Um, in this case, a process takes place during the repetition. The white noise comes in. Um, all kinds of other things actually happen. You listen closely. You hear Paul going, you know, nuts on the bass. Um, you know, I don't mean that pejoratively. Uh, there's great stuff happening in the bass line. Um, and all over the place. And Billy Preston and... Uh, you know, it's uh, it's an incredible track, even more incredible in 5.1 if you have the um, Abbey Road uh, recent reissue deluxe edition and something to play that on. Um, so I Want You, She's So Heavy would be my second one just because I it, it, it just seemed like repetition to me at the time. I didn't quite understand what that was. Uh, you know, whether John knew much about minimalism I don't know, but Yoko would have. Yoko hang out, hung out in that crowd before she mm. met John. Um, so she knew those composers. She knew what they were doing. Um, and it's very possible that she put him on to that kind of thing. And then from John's side, um, only a year earlier, he had been meditating. And that also has a, a, a repetition component. So, you know, putting all of these strands together, um, I think, you know, made that song what it is in, in a lot of ways. Um, my third one is uh, Little Lamb Dragonfly. I was going to say Backseat in My Car, but I keep talking about how brilliant I think Backseat in My Car is. So we'll go to another one, <laughs> which is uh, Little Lamb Dragonfly, which in a way I also mentioned last week because it was the closer of one of the two disc set versions of uh, Red Rose Speedway and would have been, if they had put that one out, would have been uh, on my list of favorite closers. Little Lamb Dragonfly, you know, it was... Um, one of those things that, uh, you know, Paul had two songs, um, one about this lamb that was dying, you know, or it died and it was sort of left to him to sort of, you know, clean up. Um, and while he was doing that, uh, the, the verses came to him and, you know, and that, that's, that's pretty typical, Paul, you know, I mean, um, this is a guy who, basically lives and breathes music. And if the job at hand is cleaning up after a dead sheep, it's not surprising he came up with a song. <laughs> uh, um, and the other part of it, the dragonfly was, you know, he was up in, um, in Scotland and, uh, you know, noticed the dragonfly hanging out outside his window. And so he's, you know, he's singing a song to this dragonfly, singing a song to the lamb. The two of them went together. It was originally... Um, slated for Rupert, which he had just acquired the rights to and wanted to make a Rupert film and um, had already written a few pieces. Little Lamb Dragonfly was originally for that, recorded during the Ram sessions um, with an orchestration by George Martin. That was recorded in New York as well. Um, 
and just got left off RAM. And um, I don't know why he took it out of the Rupert pile and put it in Red Rose Speedway, but he did. And it's actually one of my favorite tracks on that album. I guess when it came out or when I first heard it, it just didn't make that much impression. It was, it seemed maybe a little silly because, you know, talking to animals and all that. Um, but, you know, I think I've now come to terms with Paul talking to animals and other people. <laughs> um, uh, you know, having avoided Dr. Doolittle as a kid, <laughs> maybe uh, I should see it now. But, um, you know, it's, it, it really is a gorgeous song and it's beautifully put together. And I think I just didn't really focus on it when, when it first came out. And uh, so now I love it. Um, Here's one that will send Ken into a frenzy. Um, Give Me Love from his favorite album of all time. The hit single from his favorite album of all time. Mm. Didn't like it when it came out. Um, to me, uh, I didn't like the way his voice sounded. It seemed a little bit whiny. Um, uh, you know, help me cope with this heavy load, I thought was kind of, you know, we should all have a load so heavy as George Harrison in the immediate post Beatles years. Mm. Um, but, you know, of course he's not talking about that. He's talking about the spiritual thing. And uh, when he says, keep me free from birth, which was puzzling to me at the time, you know, he's talking about that sort of cycle of, of um, death and rebirth in Hindu philosophy that, you know, until you can perfect yourself, you're going to keep coming back. And that's something to be avoided if you possibly can, um, can perfect yourself in this lifetime and not have to come back. Uh, that's what that song is about. And it's kind of a lot to, um, I suppose, expect a pop listener to deal with. Um, but, you know, like within you, without you, he was expecting a lot of his listeners. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it, it, it's, it's rewarding when you come to terms with it. Um, I think also, in a way, at the time, I didn't really like that slide guitar sound that he really had. And, and that was and that was one of the first times that particular kind of slide guitar playing, you know, I think I think in the time in between all things must pass in Bangladesh and living in the material world, he developed that very distinctive sound. Um, I came to really love it, you know, and not too long after, but at the time, I, I don't know, I just found it a little annoying, maybe in combination with what I thought were whiny vocals. But now, uh, you know, listening to it again, uh, and in fact, actually, one of the reasons I chose it is because a few weeks ago, um, I, I must have been, I don't know where I was because I don't go very many places now. Um, but I was in a, a, a shop or something and Give Me Love came on the sound system. And I thought, whoa, oh, Give Me Love. That, wow, I haven't heard that in a while. And, you know, and I listened and really liked it. And I remembered, you know, I, I, I didn't like this much when it came out. And so when we came up with this as a topic, it was one of the first things that I thought of. Um, because it's, you know, it's a great song. You know, I'm sorry, Ken. I'm sorry for not liking it <laughs> originally. <laughs> so just one question. You, did, you, you didn't like George's slide guitar sound. Didn't you like what he played on My Sweet Lord? Yeah, but it's not the same sound. Um, on Give Me Love, first of all, he has multiple slide guitars going. It's like harmonic. Uh, on My Sweet Lord, it's just the one line. And it's just like a slide guitar sound like anybody would get. I think he really developed the kind of sound that you hear on, on Give Me Love and everything subsequently where you slide in that period between All Things Must Pass mm. and recording that, because it's a very distinctive sound. It's not, it's, it's not the same as the sound on My Sweet Lord. And it cries out George Harrison much more. I mean, My Sweet Lord does for other reasons, um, but, but this guitar sounds, you know, really does now. Um, and my, my, ears, my ears do hear two lines in My Sweet Lord being played. Maybe in some places, but yeah. um, on Give Me Love, it's it's pretty persistent. 
Anyway, okay. it, it, it just struck me as a, as a different kind of sound. And um, I guess I guess it was just new to me and I wasn't used to it and thought it was odd. And where, who knows what I was thinking? It was a long time ago. <laughs> hmm. I think um, when you have those descending notes in My Sweet Lord and what he's playing, there's two lines, but there are parts when it's just one line. Oh, yeah. So I yeah. think it's a combination of both. Right. Okay. Yeah. Could I just bounce off a few things you said there, Ellen? Because I found your choices to be perfect and, and really excellent choices. But I always found it really, uh, it, 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 it's stupefying to me. Um, and, and yes, I think that John and Paul didn't realize the talent that George, how much he was blossoming as a songwriter. And evidently neither did George Martin, because there's a, there's a quote that I actually have the audio of George Martin saying this, that the first time he was ever really knocked out by anything that George wrote was here comes the sun. Mm -hmm. I mean, my God, (laughs) Uh, that's kind of late in the game there, I would say, but here he is doing the score for Western instruments and Eastern instruments on within you, without you. He's got to know all the work he's putting into a song like that. Mm-hmm. He must have had some kind of respect or, or reverence for what George was doing at the time with Within You, Without You. Uh, it's kind of hard for me to believe for someone who poured that much work into a score like that, that he wouldn't recognize how, you know, how great a song that was. I mean, that's a song that I now point to as one that, wow, it was w- way over my head when it first came out. I was just a kid. I couldn't understand all the spirituality and the, the philosophical stuff that George was saying. But once you add all the musicality, all, all the musical el- elements in there, it's a masterpiece. Mm-hmm. It's one of the most brilliant pieces of music uh, among many that the Beatles recorded. And it's just, uh, it boggles the mind how George Martin didn't recognize that then, or I suppose the other Beatles. Mm-hmm. But yeah, that's... I got one more. That was only yeah. four. Oh, sorry. Say, <laughs> I was just going to say, wait a minute, that's just four. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So for the last one, I cheated because as Darren was saying it's, it's easier with albums. Um, this is one piece and it's also an album and that's Standing Stone. Didn't like Standing Stone that much when it came out. I had loved Liverpool Oratorio um, and I recently had a, an opportunity to listen to it again because um, uh, I had accidentally taped some live performances of it and um, wanted to transfer them to digital. Um, and so, you know, got to hear it again. Um, and, uh, but, but that one I liked in the first place. Standing Stone um, disappointed me because um, it seemed, uh, my feeling at the time was that um, without texts to set, you know, and, and, people to sing them, you know, that, 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 that Paul's real medium is the song and oratorio is a, a bunch of really extended songs, you know, plus a lot of other stuff too, but the song structure gave him um, a hook that he could work on. This was um, a big symphonic instrumental work and I felt that he was a little bit more at sea uh, and, you know, sort of Speaking of at sea, it, it, it just seemed to me like, um, you know, when he's when his hero is on the ocean, you get this sort of Debussy sea kite type music. And when he's in a battle, you get this sort of Shostakovich like battle music. And it seemed to me at the time a little paint by numbers. You know, it's like like, OK, this is what I know about what these classical composers do. And when I want to present that picture, I'm going to borrow that kind of sound. Um, You know, plus possibly the fact that on Oratorio, he had one collaborator on Standing Stone. He had many helping him with the orchestration and stuff. Um, And that was just the way I feel about it. But um, when I was on um, Two Legs podcast. Uh, I've made a couple of appearances, particularly to talk about Paul's classical pieces. And Oratorio was easy because I loved it. And Standing Stone was more of a problem. But when I sat down to listen to it after not hearing it, you know, since shortly after it was new, um, it 
struck me completely differently. It no longer seemed like paint by numbers. I could see what I mean meant, um, you know, that the C music was a little bit WC leg, the battle music was a little Shostakovich like, but it wasn't, it wasn't that um, amorphous anymore. It seemed to fit together better. Um, and so I, I, I sort of reclaimed that for, uh, you know, things of his that I like. And uh, so I, I, I just began to look at it a bit differently. I think, you know, sometimes when things are new and especially if you're reviewing them, um, you can overthink them, you know, you can, you can just like get too much into the weeds and you're no longer having the kind of experience that everybody else is having because you're wondering about this and worrying about that. And does this too much this? And is that too much that? And it, you know, sometimes you just have to sit back and listen. Um, and I think that's what I was able to do when I was getting ready for my appearance on two legs. You know, I just wanted to hear it again, you know, and, you know, I remembered what I thought about it, but hearing it again, I, I didn't really think that, you know, I thought it worked a lot better. Uh, so that's my fifth. Interesting. Very interesting. It just goes to show, you know, I, I've said it many times that opinions can change over time. Mm -hmm. So, uh, there's proof of that. I mean, do you, do you also, um, think very highly of all the other classical things that Paul's done? Uh, I mostly like them. I mean, some of them are just, you know, more like studies for, you know, bigger things he was going to work on. Um, but yeah, there, there, there are actually quite a few really nice little pieces. Um, when Standing Stone was done at Carnegie Hall, uh, the first half of the program was a bunch of short pieces, one or two of which might not have actually been recorded, um, you know, on, on his cla other classical compilation album. Um, and I accidentally recorded that too. I don't know what keeps happening to me. <laughs> uh, and um, transferred that recently as well and, and listened to some of those. Those were, those, you know, I, I, I did enjoy them. Um, I think, you know, I, I, he hasn't done it in a while. I know that in, in 2007, around the time of memory, almost full, he was working on a guitar concerto. Mm -hmm. um, and I wish he'd finished that because one of the things that I felt about um, oratoria was, you know, there's this one section with a long violin solo. And I thought, you know, this guy could write a concerto, really. I mean, because that was beautifully done. And a guitar, you know, he knows how to play that. But he was also working with a classical guitarist named Carlos Bonell, um, who I know. And, um, but I've never, um, I've never had an opportunity to ask him about that, actually. I should, should send him an email. Um, but, you know, I, I, I kind of wish he had continued with his classical stuff because, uh, you know, it gets better as you go on and he stopped going on. So, um, you know, I, I, I hope he picks that up again someday. Do you know for a fact that he didn't finish the guitar? I don't know that he didn't finish it, but we didn't hear it. That's, you know, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so maybe he did finish it. I'm not sure. Hmm. All right. I, I got to say, uh, fantastic list. Thank and um, <clears throat> I want you, She's So Heavy would have been a candidate for me, although it's been so long since I've loved this song. When I was younger and it first came out, it was, you know, tedious uh, till it really, you know, uh, you get older, your ears mature and the rest of you matures if you're lucky. Um, but you're able, I was able to really to, you know, uh, pick up on that. And I think one of the songs when I get my list in, uh, sort of, I, I didn't like it at first, but like it today for the same, same reasons. And Little Lamb Dragonfly is one of my favorite McCartney songs ever, period. Mm. Um, mm. So anyway, same, so same for me. Let's throw it on over to Ken and uh, hear his five. Okay. I also want to just add great choices there, Alan. And um, I did, I did want to say one thing about Standing Stone because you know, you listen to the Liverpool Oratorio, and even if you weren't told that it that Paul McCartney wrote it, it sounds like a McCartney work. You know, there are certain melodies there that are distinctly McCartney. Yeah. But Standing mm -hmm. Stone was very different because it was very dissonant for me. 
the melodies didn't go in the kind of direction that you kind of expect them to, with the ex exception of Celebration, which is a gorgeous piece of work. Um, but it's interesting that you said that. I should really go back and listen more to Standing Stone, you know, but I do like uh, most of what he's done with his classical work. Um, all right, so I'm going to do one Beatles and one from each solo. That's that's kind of what uh, I felt like doing for something like this. Um, and I wanted to make sure that I didn't repeat songs that I've said already, because um, we've done shows like this before. And certainly in the other um, podcast show, Talk More Talk, we talk about underrated songs or underappreciated songs. When it comes to the Beatles group stuff, I like all the songs. It's never a case of I didn't like the song and I like it now. It's more a case of I like it more now than I did before. So, but the ones that I've said in the past, just so that I don't repeat them now and talk about them at length now would be Within You, Without You, Julia, and I'll Be Back. But the one I want to bring up is Wait, which is a song I think is very much overlooked. When Rubber Soul first came out and I was brought up on the American album, that was one of my favorite songs from the album. And despite knowing now that it was actually a song that they worked on on their previous album, Help, and they resurrected when they needed a few more songs to finish up Rubber Soul, I've always felt it's a really good composition. I like the syncopation in it. It's been a long time. You know, it's a little bit different in that, in that regard. And I also like songs where you have more than one lead vocalist. Although John and Paul harmonize through the verses, there's that middle section that Paul sings lead to. I like when they do that once in a while in their songs, like A Day in the Life mm -hmm. or um, A Hard Day's Night, it's another example. And uh, it just ends so brilliantly the way that the verses end, you know. Um, I've been away now, oh how I've been alone. Mm -hmm. It just works so perfectly. The Beatles had a way, you know, their songs are so brilliant, but when you can pack so much into two minutes, two and a half minutes, and the melody is so good and the harmonies are so good and it's well constructed for a song that, you know, they brought back from a previous album that what they didn't weren't happy you like with. about it originally? Oh, I always liked it. That's what I'm what? saying. I always liked it, but I like it more now oh, than okay. I did before. So you're changing the concept into songs that I like? But I really like, like a lot more now. Yeah. Okay. There, there are no Beatles songs that I didn't like. You know, what you pointed out there with Wait is great. And this is the brilliance of the Beatles. Most of these songs we talk about, we listen to every day. On first listen or passive listen are so simple, these songs. Hmm. Till you spend time with them and you, and, you, and you pay attention to the things that they were doing. And you're like, you know, this is brilliant. You know what I mean? And it yeah. came so naturally to them. You know, that they, like song after song, they found out another little nuance to, to basically do the same thing again, create a pop song, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, it's mind boggling. You pointed that about weight. And I never, it, that never struck me the way the da, 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 mm -hmm. da, 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 da. It's like, oh, shoot, shoot. <laughs> Oh, I almost said a bad word, but uh, anyway, as you but, were. Uh, yeah, I've always loved that song. Love it more now. Mm -hmm. um, from John, I picked You Are Here. <clears throat> you Are Here, which uh, I just think is a beautiful song. One of the last songs on the Mind Games album. I love the whole concept of it, that John's from Liverpool, Yoko's from Tokyo, and, you know, the twain shall meet. You know, these two different people from different countries, and they were meant to be together. And it's a lovely melody. I love the whole vibe of it. It's got a folk feel to it. It's got a country feel to it. Um, it's just absolutely gorgeous. There are so many songs. You know, John is so well known for having that edge and being a great rocker. But he can write the greatest love songs just like Paul could and just like George could. And that's just one of the many that I feel are just overlooked. The Mind Games album, I've said many times, Out the Blue, I Know, I Know, amongst the best of his love songs. I assume Ascend is one of my favorites. But You Are Here is just another one that I feel is just overlooked. Mm -hmm. um, Paul, I want to make sure that I mention, because I know I've said Little M Dragonfly too, and um, in recent years, The End of the End, which I think is 
probably in the top 10 of his songs of all time from memory almost full um i don't want to repeat that but i'm gonna go with um tough on a tightrope which was one of the bonus tracks from press to play i love the work that he did with eric stewart as a songwriter and um you know, it's it's a song about a, a relationship that's struggling. And I like the words to it. I like the melody. Sometimes the bridge of a song when it's really good. And I feel that way about a song like this one from Paul, where the bridge is just so perfect and flows so well. And I like the um, the bridge on that particular song. I'm often accused of giving too little. It's got me confused. I'm split down the middle conflicting reviews of our lives coming in it's tough on a tightrope i love the words of that of that song and there are certain songs that he wrote with with eric stewart where i'm not sure if paul wrote the words or not or eric did we need an in-depth interview with with paul or eric on that but tough on a tightrope is one of those those songs that made me love press to play even more because i always loved the album but once she got those three bonus tracks that add so much more to it um, so that's the one I chose from Paul. Um, you're going to notice these are all ballads. I'm a love songs kind of guy, I guess. Um, and uh, all the Beatles gave us so many great love songs. The one I picked from George was Never Get Over You from Brainwash. That's another song that has a beautiful melody. The slide guitar that George is playing just accents all the lines in the song and makes the song even more emotional in what he's saying. I love the words of the song. Your eyes pierce through my heart. Your smile tears me apart. I knew it. It's so true. I'll never get over you. I also love the line. You warm the coldest feet can cool me in the heat. Um, just a gorgeous song. There's so many songs like that scattered through the solo Beatles catalog that are just great love songs that most people don't know because they were in singles and they weren't hits. And that's just one of many of George, but I thought I'd pick that one. The one from Ringo that I picked is a really obscure one. Um, I love this song more and more every time I hear it. As Far As We Can Go, which is a song on the Old Wave album. And it was actually written by Russ Ballard, who's known for have, having been in Argent. Mm -hmm. And um, originally the song was written for the bad boy album and there's an early version of that that was a bonus track on the old wave album where it appeared the newer version the old version i'm not too crazy about it goes on a little bit way too long but um it's a very melancholy song about the end of a relationship i thought our love song would go on and on people talk yes i think they know we've gone as far as we can go um, and, you know, for all that's said about Ringo having a, a limited vocal range, his vocals work in the songs that he records. And I do like the sound of Ringo's vocals when it's backed by orchestration, going back to a song like Good Night. You know, and this is very much in that vein, as far as we can go. Very sad song. I love sad songs from the solo Beatles. This one really works. Uh, the orchestration really helps to make the whole song work. But Ringo's vocals are just really perfect for this kind of song. These sad songs that Ringo can do very well. Um, sad songs say so much, as another songwriter put it. But um, two songwriters. So those are my five choices. Wait, You Are Here, Tough on a Tightrope never get over you and as far as we can go okay i'm keeping track here and i'm uh, hoping we don't duplicate no we, we almost always do yeah well, <laughs> this would be the first time <laughs> while you guys are picking your songs i'm like boy my list stinks <laughs> i doubt that so i'm actually going around saying, take this off what were you thinking you idiot put that in there Anyway, no, I didn't do that, but I was tempted to. Um, uh, I found this hard. I found this whole practice hard. I think part of it could be because, you know, my brain doesn't work like it did when I was younger. So I'm sitting there going, why can't I think of these songs that I've listened to a baz bazillion times? Hmm. Try to do digging around, try to 
refresh my memory. And that's when I, when I found that albums was easier for me because there's a bunch of albums that I didn't get it when they first came out, whether it was, I was too young. Uh, my ear wasn't ready for maybe a, that was the case for me with McCartney too. I wasn't prepared for that at 15 to mm. coming off of back to the egg. Uh, right. Chaos and creation in the backyard. I needed, I remember two listens of, I don't know, but something kept telling me, give it another one. And that was like getting hit with a two by four on the side of the head. Uh, I didn't get it yeah. like, uh, and then, wow. Mm. Um, and mind games was the same thing. I think mind games, I tended to just gloss over. Mm. I, I preferred, always preferred, I still do a little bit, prefer Walls and Bridges. And I kind of think of those two albums as sort of almost kind of, you listen to one, then go listen to the other. Uh, and then, and it's very possible that you swayed me, Ken, because I know how you've been talking highly about mind games for years, mm. long before this show ever started, um, when we'd have conversations when we were together, how much you loved mind games. And I also remember somebody that I worked with at WFUV in the 80s, out of the blue, no pun intended, came and we were talking about solo albums. And that was like her favorite. And that struck me like, why mind games? And then, you know, I go back and listen and go, I, I, I see this. For me, that album was not tainted by being worn out on the radio. That kept it fresh for me so that when I was ready for it, it was like a, a, a new discovery a lot of times and still to an extent is. And one of the songs from that album is on my list. Now, these songs are in no particular order. They're as they pop into my head. Starting off with one that I really don't know why I like now. Um, I really can't give you a good reason. I don't want to be a soldier, mama. <laughs> I don't want to die. Even though I, I still to this day, what is the actual title of it? Is it supposed to be just, I don't want to be a soldier? Uh, or is it that whole whole line? It all depends on whether you're reading the inner sleeve or the record label or what book you're looking at. Um, I always thought that that was a, a real heavy weight that pulled Imagine down, that song. Uh, and I could understand if people have that opinion of it, because I have, I have heard that, you know, that's not one of the, a lot of people's favorite Lennon songs. Just one day I'm listening to it going, this is great. And again, I'm sorry, I can't tell you really why. It just took a, many years for the song to, to really strike me. It's um, another John Lennon minimalist classic, you know, it's, 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 it, it has some of the same qualities as I want you. She's so heavy. Yeah. Oh yeah. I, yeah. You're right. And the lyrics kind of all kind of repeating the same concept, slightly different ways a few times. And that was it. Uh, I don't want to be a soldier mama. I don't want to die. But that's, that's, that's actually pretty deep. So that was the first song that popped into my head when I was Darren? putting this list together. Yeah, for years I, I was saying that that song and Angela were like the only John Lennon solo songs I didn't care for. Mm -hmm. And now I love I Don't Want to Be a Soldier, mm -hmm. mainly because it's so different in the, in the fact that it's loose and it's almost like, you know, a jam session. And uh, it's not that structured, you know, like most of John's pop rock songs are. Mm -hmm. So I appreciate it on that level. Mm -hmm. But it's funny when you go back and you listen to all these different recordings that exist of I don't want to be a soldier. He tried it in a lot of different arrangements. So right. for it to turn out the way it did on Imagine is kind of interesting why they why they took that that specific kind of an arrangement. But right. I like it because it's so different. Yeah. Yeah. The second one I picked is similar that when I first would hear it, I didn't get it. I even thought it was a bit goofy. And then one day it just clicked. Loop, first Indian on the moon. All right. And from Wings, from Red Rose Speedway. And I think what eventually pulled me in there was seeing Denny Sywell at Beetlefest and listening to him play, not that, but just listening to him and watching him play and the style and hearing him without, you know, other instruments around him on a recording and uh, talk a little bit about his jazz background that um, I came to appreciate his playing so much more. And then um, I realized, uh, you know, 
the styles that they jump. There's a little jazz part in there that uh, that Denny's able to settle into, which is a strength for him. And McCartney's bass playing. It's one of the it's one of the songs that really uh, does a great job and in, mm-hmm. in uh, you know displaying his talents as a bass player. And I'd love to know. I, don't, I mean, I guess it's when Alan, when your book comes out, um, uh, I don't know if that's a song that gets any in depth attention. It but uh, it, I'd, I'd love to know his mindset into that song. Uh, you know, years ago, I used to think, I know this is probably a stretch, but Wings were doing recording for at Abbey Road for Red Rose Speedway. And Pink Floyd were doing recording at Abbey Road for the Dark Side of the Moon uh, at, at, at the same time at one point. And I wondered if that kind of kind of like Dark Side vibe, which Paul had to have heard in his travels through Abbey Road at that time. And he was friends with, I, I, at least we know he's friends with David Gilmore, but uh, for, for, for the folks that maybe may not know the connection, it, Paul and Linda, and I don't know if all the members of Wings, but at least Henry McCullough, were interviewed for those spoken word passages mm-hmm. on the dark side of the moon, and only Henry McCullough was actually used. I think Paul and Paul and Linda had been interviewed too many times and were too clever with their answers to give what Pink Floyd, what Roger Waters was looking for. Right. Yeah. You know, so. um, in, in terms of Loop, um, Linda had just gotten a mini Moog. And um, I think the, the track began really with them just playing with the mini Moog in the studio and it became a piece of music um, mm-hmm. eventually, uh, you know, sort of got, um, you know, started off very sort of jammy and then they, they sort of constricted it a bit. Um, I think uh, it was, was Glenn Johns was in charge of those sessions, I believe. Of Red Rose Speedway in the beginning. Yeah, he, it, he, he didn't see it, you know, he, he felt that they were just sort of messing about. Um, but it turned into, as you say, a, a kind of interesting piece of music. Uh, one that a lot of people don't like. I mean, you hear it trashed all the time, but, you know, if, if you listen to it, closely there's there's a lot of interesting stuff in it that album red rose speedway is one that today i very proudly say is one of my favorite mccartney's in fact it's number three behind ram and band on the run um years ago i always felt like i was being it was it wasn't a a smart pick to say this was one of my favorite mccartney's Mm. Uh, albums but that really became such an important album to me it was my first McCartney album as a solo well solo act Mm. um had the I had it on cassette and sometimes uh, I really believe this um when you're young and music makes an impression or a person makes an impression on you you Mm. carry that for the rest of your life uh and I still hear Red Rose Speedway on a cassette pre-recorded tape on a little portable Zenith mono tape recorder. Okay. And there's something about the production of that album being played in that, you know, in that, in that fashion, Mm -hmm. that there was a certain um, sonic quality to the whole album. Um, Yeah. It might not be as interesting in mono as in stereo, but um... (laughs) Yeah, uh, well, again, I probably got my, I probably got the cassette with buddy maybe a year and change if it was out. Oh. So I'm still not even 10 years old yet. And, and uh, it's just something about just that whole album. And one day I realized as a grown up, I'm like, damn it, it's one of my favorite albums. Oh. No one mentions it. Everyone likes this, so that and the other thing. So, uh, so anyway, Loop, first Indian on the Moon, second song in my list. Number three, kind of, rub shoulders with uh, Ken picking you are here because I'm going with, I know, I know, mm-hmm. um, which is almost identical for you, Ken, with, with you are here. Um, when I finally started saying, you know, I got to listen to mind games a little closer. It was those songs, especially on side two that could, you know, could very easily have fallen through the cracks that really suddenly appealed to me and caught my ear 
those two side by side, I'm, they are side by side. Right. Uh, um, I know, I know goes into your here. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And uh, I know, I know it's just uh, that for me, the melody, the guitar part, um, which is actually reminds me of another song and I can't think of it now. Well, the beginning has a sort of sounds a little bit like I've got a feeling the beginning of I've got a yeah, feeling. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I couldn't think of it. Um, and that was a good example of, of me coming to the party late for that song and for the entire Mind Games album, everything on it. Um, and, you know, it's kind of like more so than Imagine and more so than Plastic Ono Band, only because Plastic Ono Band's not the kind of album you put on and you're driving it's not down. A party album. Yeah. You know, I go to Mind Games, I go to Walls and Bridges usually. And like I said, uh, I have those two to play together because, you know, to me, they kind of belong together. But uh, so that's my uh, third one. I know, I know. Uh, the next two are Beatles songs. And this one I wasn't going to pick until it occurred to me that when I used to hear it for the first time, it scared the bejesus out of me. So let's go back in time to 1970 and little Darren DeVivo. And if you know me personally and you know my size, the thought of little five-year-old Darren sitting on his... Uh, uh, on, on the kitchen countertop in his, you know, folks three room apartment with his little show and tell phonograph and that I actually would fit on this narrow countertop listening to my records, watching my apples spin around on the turntable. Uh, <laughs> Let it be was wonderful, but my goodness, you know, my name, look up the number used to scare <laughs> the crap out of me. Uh, it Cause I did what was going on here. Are these the Beatles? How is that possible? What have they done to the Beatles? And who's the guy at the end? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I would actually sometimes not play it. You know, I wouldn't play it. Scared the shit out of me. Sorry. Scared the crap out of me. Um, but uh, that <laughs> Ken told me it's okay to say those words. Um, no, I didn't. But, <laughs> but uh, You're in trouble. And then because it was for so many years a lost b-side that you never heard when i hear it now the few times you can hear it on the radio or when i've played it on wfuv volume goes all the way up because it is just so off the wall it's the greatest thing in the world and i still would love to have been a fly on the wall during some of those sessions because i know it was pieced together mm. but uh just to, to to see what on earth was going on in the studio when they were recording this but when i was five man Wow, that I scared I, them, you know. I understand that it's it's a weird recording, but how does that scare you? I think the voices. I think not understanding that that like, and I'm again. This isn't me now. I'm five years hmm. old and hearing the Beatles and hearing "Let It Be," turn the record over, and it's like. <laughs> you know what I mean? And I would yeah. love to have heard it as an adult for the first time. You know, be that person. As some songs, I would love to have been in the room with, a, with an, a mature listener listening to Revolver for the first time in 66 and Tomorrow Never Knows come on and see the reaction that somebody was getting to hearing that for the first time in 66. Mm. And I would love to have seen the big Beatle fan in 1970 flip over Let It Be and react to you know my name, look up the number. It was so out of character. For yeah. Them. And, and, and to release and, that too, you know. Yeah. yeah. Well, listen, John wanted to release it with um, uh, what what a shame Mary Jane had to paint at the party. Hmm. Or what's yeah. the new Mary Jane? Um, yeah. that, and would it been, was that would have been quite a single. He considered it as a Plastic Ono <laughs> band uh, mm -hmm. release. Mm -hmm. All right. So, and then at the bottom of my list, which will make Alan happy, is Revolution 9. Um, um, Revolution 9, as I got older and listened more and, you know, again, learn more and whatnot, a Revolution 9 to me is a, is a sound capsule of 1968 and the culture at the time, uh, the Vietnam War. Um, it was the, the 60s still had a mystique to them, but there was ugliness starting to pop up in 68. And John captured that. Again, I don't know if he was just messing around with tapes and that's what he came up with, or he had a goal in what he wanted the finished product to sound like. Uh, and the menacing kind of, um, that used to also kind of, uh, kind of 
scare me a bit when I was younger and hearing those little voices and you know, Eldorado. Mm-hmm. You know, and then when I found out, you know, if you listen to it and spin it backwards, you know, Paul's head fell off, you know, you'd hear all these things in there. Um, But then as I got older, I'm like, you know what? It's actually another example of Beatle brilliance, or in this case, John's brilliance uh, to to just in, in eight minutes sum up. In an, like a, in, in, in an avant-garde way, a sound collage that sums up uh, the period that they were in, perhaps even the period, the, perhaps even how, in John's head, how he felt about the situation he was in, in the Beatles, Yoko coming into his life, his maver- marriage ending, and this madness that may have been rolling around in his head came through in all of these tape loops that uh, he started playing with. You know, I think in a way, um, Revolution Number no. Nine is an explanation of one line in Revolution, which is when you talk about destruction, don't you know that you can count me out? And he's now decided it's not out in, out in, it's just out. And he's showing you what happens in a revolution. I mean, he's created. Uh, an, an audio sort of soundscape of a society just imploding, you know? And, and, and I think, I mean, it's, it's, you, you can't ever really say what someone's really thinking, but it seems like there's too much stuff in there for it to be an accident, you know, and it being called still revolution, you know, as part of the series where you've got the slow one, then the electric fast one, and then this complete breakdown of everything. Um, that's the way I always look at it. Um, but I know, wish there had been a film of them working on it. And how much, how much involvement did Yoko play in it? I mean, she was such a big influence yeah. on John at the time. You yeah, know, and with, this was this was really Yoko's wheelhouse as well. You know, hmm. this is this is again the world she came from. This was not that uncommon. Um, and so, George yeah. Harrison was involved with it too, to some mm-hmm. degree. Mm-hmm. But I'd love to hear how they picked those those pieces, <laughs> you know, and strung them together. And you know, it's do we not? There... John recorded it. Did the work uh, at Abbey Road? Mm-hmm. I would assume. Uh, I always listen to it going, you know, you, you, you hear about how they were very, the, uh, the, the engineers and the staff at Abbey Road were very obviously, uh, and it would make sense, protective of the use of the equipment. But you wonder how much like tape machine abuse uh, and where John went to do it, if he had to sort of go off and work on his own, how long did it take? Where did he get all these tapes? So I would love to have watched again. To only be a fly on the wall, if yeah. only, you know, to see how he built that. Well, so Paul was absent. So you know, he was, I think he was out of the country even. And um, so that gave John a, a certain measure of freedom because Paul wasn't there to sort of say, okay, guys, let's work on, you know, Blackbird now or, or you know, whatever, you know, probably uh, oh, bloody, oh, bloody, oh, bloody, oh, Maxwell. Um, but, uh, you know, not Maxwell yet. <laughs> no, not Maxwell yet. Um, you know, I, and I think that, you know, John just sort of had had run of the studio. And, and I, I believe I remember reading about him saying that they were basically using every studio and had different tape loops on different machines and different studios all feeding into you know, the console in studio two or three. So he could sort of lift the faders up and, you know, get different sounds. So some of it was um, obviously a a bit random, but, you know, they still had to decide, you know, okay, when, when should we bring this sound in? When should we bring that sound in? And how should, how should it end? You know, Mm -hmm. you become naked. (laughs) Um, It's, it's really fascinating. It had to be in the middle of the you know, night to have access to all the studios and no super supervisors roaming around, mm, you know, right. and uh, yelling down the hallway to each other. <laughs> you know, John, do you want tape two? <laughs> no, number nine. That's right. But anyway, um, so those are my five. 
Um, and uh, that's that, I guess. Okay. Yeah. Excellent choices. By yeah. the way, the thing about um, Loop and Dark Side of the Moon, mm-hmm. I've wondered that myself. You have. Plus you, have yeah. you, you have the Alan Parsons connection, too. Yeah, and, and they were. I mean, Pink Floyd did all of the Dark Side of the Moon and Abbey Road, and I know that I mean, wish you, uh, wish we, Red Rose Speedway was, uh, you know, kind of recorded over a period of time. Uh, some of the stuff even going back to Ram. Uh, but there had to be a sizable period where, you know, wings were in Abbey Road for a week or two or three. And, uh, and you know, and Pink Floyd were down the hall. And, you know, because, uh, you know, again, the story on how they got those voices on the dark side of the moon were... Um, you know, they just interviewed people. Roger Waters, I think, did um, uh, interviewed people in the uh, in the staff, the doorman, someone working mm-hmm. the front desk, the band down the hall, which happened to be Wings, and asked questions like, "Have you ever been in a fight? Were you in the right?" Um, mm-hmm. And th- these answers ended up being the sounds, those voices that kind of float through. And and it's Henry McCullough who says, "I don't know. I was really drunk at the time." <laughs> So anyway, that's our list, folks. Uh, songs that we didn't get then, but we get them now, uh, courtesy of your friends at Things We Said Today. Or, or you like it, more now than you did before. Or, or in Ken's case, songs that you loved then, but you love them even more now. <laughs> we, we should, should do, the, do the stuff. same thing with albums. We should do, we should do something with, with songs we love then, but now... <laughs> But Ken, I know, doesn't have probably old. I that don't. Many of them. I don't I have any. But there is a few that didn't hold up. But let's go around the horn here and uh, and uh, share our individual contact information and other uh, other important things. And we will see then there. <laughs> Keep throwing those honeymoon <laughs> references in there. So uh, as well, for you, me, uh, let Al, uh, we started with Alan. Uh, so Alan, you go first. Okay. Maniac. Okay. Um, you can reach me on Facebook at either Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed. And you can write to all of us. Tell us about your string of Pelopenies yeah. at Things We Said Today Radio Show at gmail.com. It's Things We Said Today Radio Show, all one word, at gmail.com. You can follow us on Twitter. We have a Twitter feed at Things We Said Fab. Um, we also have two Facebook pages, things we said today and things we said today, Beatles radio fans. Um, you can catch the shows on, uh, the audio only version. If you want to go back to audio, sort of like back to mono, um, and it is in mono on Podbean, Um, and we're on iTunes. Um, but the spectacular video version is on YouTube um, and please subscribe to us if you haven't already. I think that's it for me. Okay. All right, Ken. Uh, if you want to reach me by email, my address is every little thing at att.net. I have a website, kenmichaelsradio.com, with loads of interviews that I've done in the past, audio interviews with people connected to the Beatles. And there's also weekly Beatles trivia where you can win one of 10 prizes every single week. They could be books, CDs, DVDs, once in a while, even vinyl. And um, that's at KenMichaelsRadio.com. I also have another podcast, talk show podcast called Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast, which happens normally every two weeks, Monday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern on our Facebook page, Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast. After that, after the initial live broadcast, it's heard and also it's on YouTube. It's on every platform imaginable. It's on iTunes, it's on iHeartRadio, it's on Spotify, it's on YouTube. And uh, the next show that we're doing, which is next Monday, uh, which will be the 27th of September, we'll be reviewing the new Ringo Starr EP change the world and uh, we're probably going to do that anyway on our show the next show that we're doing but uh we'll review the ep and that show is with kiddo tool joe mayo and tom hunyadi of the two legs podcast 
And then there's also my YouTube channel where I have one-on-one -on -one interviews with people talking Beatles. And that's at Ken Michaels Radio. And please subscribe to that. Um, just recently, I interviewed John Borak, who is the author of the new book, The Beatles 100, 100 Pivotal Moments in Beatle History. That's exactly what the book's all about incredible moments the most significant ones in the history of the Beatles and in their solo careers that's uh, one of my new ones right there there'll be new ones coming this week and every single week in most cases so if you can please subscribe to that Ken Michaels radio and uh, I believe that that's it all right and as I mentioned up top I'm from WFUV radio and if you want to listen and I'd love you to listen. Uh, tune in if you're in the New York City metro area, 90.7 FM or 90.7 FM HD2. If you are one to uh, explore the HD side of radio, I don't know how many folks do that these days. Um, so 90.7 FM, but everywhere else, stream us at WFUV.org uh, or download our app and listen there. And I can be heard Monday through Thursday nights at 10 p.m and Saturday afternoons at uh, 1 p.m., 1 to 4 on WFUV. And you can email me there at WF, I'm sorry, at um, Darren DeVivo at WFUV.org. Or uh, go to Facebook, got two Facebook pages, Darren DeVivo, and uh, a second one also has my name in it. And you can shoot me a friend request at one and I'll invite you to the other or follow me on one and we'll connect. So, and that's a good way to keep in touch uh, with me. And uh, that's it for this week of, on Things We Said Today. So for Alan Coase and for Ken Michaels, uh, I'm Darren DeVivo, thanking you once again for giving us your time, hanging out with us, talking Beatles, and we will see you soon. Take care.